Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on Blackboard Collaborate today. Before starting the webinar, I'd like to go over some practical information. In case of technical difficulties, you can contact one of our moderators with a private chat message. You will find them in the list of attendees. Please also note that Google Chrome is the only browser which supports Blackboard Collaborate. You can turn off the pop-up notifications by changing your notification settings. And please feel free to post your questions for the keynote speakers in the chat. Lastly, this session will be recorded and will be made available on the UXIA website tomorrow. Thank you. And I would now like to give the floor to our moderator, Professor Ellen Van Stichel. Good afternoon or good morning for people in the Americas and good evening for people in the East and welcome to this webinar. I'm Ellen Van Stichel, Professor in Christian Social Ethics at the KU Leuven here in Belgium. And in the name of UXIA, the Trans Economy of Hope Chair of the University of Antwerp and the Economy of Communion Belgium, I'm very helpful, happy to welcome you here for this webinar on Women, Work and Care, organized in the context of the Economy of Francesco. But what is the Economy of Francesco exactly? Let's take a look. Economy of Francesco is an initiative van Paus Franciscus, die samen met jongeren, van welke achtergrond ook, om samen met hen na te denken over de nieuwe wegen die we uitgaan of willen uitgaan met onze economie. We bevinden ons op het randje van de draagkracht van onze planeet. We kunnen niet verder in een wereld die stuk is. Indien we ons kapitalistisch model niet heruitvinden, dan is het ten dode opgeschreven. En daarom de uitdaging om met die jongeren na te denken over alternatieven. En dat heeft de paus uiteraard heel goed begrepen. Il no ad una economia che uccide diventi un sì a una economia che fa vivere, perché condivide, include i poveri, usa i profitti per creare comunione. En vandaar laudato si, zijn ecologische encycliek het gaat uit van een drietal innoverende stellingen. Een eerste, het sociale en het ecologische, die vormen allebei twee zijden van dezelfde medaille. We kunnen niet zonder ook rekening te houden met de sociale implicaties van die ecologische oplossingen. Denk bijvoorbeeld aan energiebesparende maatregelen. In de mate dat die maatregelen te duur worden en onbetaalbaar, dan valt de hele categorie mensen uit de boot. Een tweede Stelling is het feit dat het milieu beschouwd wordt of moet beschouwd worden als een collectief goed. En een collectief goed moet ook beheerd worden als collectieve goederen. Er is ook een derde innoverende stelling. De biodiversiteit is ook aanwezig in de economie en die moet gewaardeerd en bewaard worden. Er zijn de kapitalistische ondernemingen, maar daarnaast bestaan uiteraard ook een heel palet aan sociale ondernemingen. In de sociale economie, denk aan maatwerkbedrijven, er zijn ook de coöperaties, er zijn waardegedreven bedrijven. De economie moet beschouwd worden als een biosysteem. Niet alleen jongeren voelen zich aangesproken om na te denken over de toekomst van onze economie, maar ook ondernemers, werknemers, studenten en academici. Ik ben Sylvain Kroon. Je travaille pour Fintroy Gueuset, la société Crone Assure Finance. Nous sommes courtiers en assurance et banquiers indépendants. Et au sein de notre société, l'économie de communion est très importante parce que l'éthique fait partie de nos valeurs de base. Je suis Joost, je euh, suis Astratec. Opgericht. Astratec est une machine à bord. Astratec est une zone de gemeenschapseconomie qui est complètement différente. Wij waren op reis in Sao Paulo en daar zagen wij die grote fabrieken juist naast de Krottenwijken. En dat had ons geraakt. En wij zeiden tegen elkaar, waarom deel die rijke fabrieken niet met de armen? Dat, dat is eigenlijk waarom ik met die gemeenschapseconomie gestart ben en dat ik dat verder doe. Donc, donner, ce n'est certainement pas que de l'argent. Ça peut être donner du temps, ça peut être donner euh, des, des, des compliments, ça peut être donner euh, des, des, des conseils. Euh, donc, il y a une multitude en fait, de manières de pouvoir exploiter cette culture du don. Ça peut se aussi être et essayer de donner un service, même si c'est financier n'est pas toujours intéressant. Et c'est justement cette, ce travail 
plus respectueux, plus humain, qui va, donner, euh, qui va permettre à l'être humain de s'épanouir au sein de l'entreprise, au sein du travail, et qui va permettre sur le long terme d'avoir euh, une économie qui tourne mieux et qui tourne de manière plus durable. La gemeenschapseconomie est toujours un verhaal van mensen kansen geven. Mijn eerste werknemer was een ex-drugverslaafde, maar die heeft nu een normaal gezin en een werk en heeft zich terug kunnen in de maatschappij brengen. In België hebben we het bedrijvencentrum Solidar, waar een aantal ondernemers samen onder één dak gehuisvest zijn. Solidar moet er zijn om gemeenschapseconomie uit te dragen, om bekendheid te maken en om mensen de kans te geven en het idee van gemeenschapseconomie met een zaak te kunnen beginnen. En donc là, Solidar a, a sa place aussi pour justement être une plateforme pour uh, engendrer de nouvelles entreprises avec cette uh, nouvelle mentalité. In het kader van Economia Francesco gaat er in Assisi een event door op ne, tussen 19 en 21 november. Maar parallel zijn er ook op verschillende plaatsen in de wereld bijeenkomsten, ontmoetingen, meetings waar uitwisselingen tussen ondernemers, tussen onderzoekers zullen plaatsvinden. Het initiatief van Paus Franciscus is een ideale, eh, vruchtbare bodem om eh, daarmee aan de slag te gaan. Er is heel veel potentieel onder studenten, onder jongeren. Aan creativiteit ontbreekt het zeker niet. Zolang er hoop is, is er een perspectief en dat perspectief willen we ook valoriseren. As the movie recalls, Pope Francis called upon young scientists, students and entrepreneurs to reflect on our current economy in order to redesign it towards a more just, inclusive and sustainable global economy for the common good. Over, over 3,000 people were supposed to meet in Assisi next week for this conference on the economy of Francesco. Due to the circumstances, it, it switched to an online event or even more so a global movement with many global and local activities like these two webinars we are hosting here. Since three decades, the worldwide network of economy of communion already works for a more people-centered market economy. Together with many other organizations, it embraces and sustains Pope Francis' call. And since it is active here in our Belgium context, we have chosen to include it in this story as part of the worldwide network which is evolving in the context of this economy of Francesco movement. Today, in this webinar, Women, Work and Care, we want to address the question on an adequate economic balance between work and care, which has lately become an even more urgent issue than it already was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The economic, health and social outcomes of the pandemic appears to be very gendered making especially women vulnerable, as they not only carry the bigger burden of caring at home when schools are closed and suffer more from unemployment due to the crisis, but are also more professionally involved in the frontline care practices which are needed to deal with the pandemic. Hence, it raises the question on the challenges this poses for our current economy, as well as on a possible and maybe much needed alternative. Again, we have two distinguished speakers to give us some insight on the matter at hand. Fitting to the team, we will only have female voices among the keynote speakers. But don't worry, in the Q&A question, I can pick up questions of men as well. Our first speaker, Mrs. Van der Meulen Rogers, is a professor in the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations and in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey, US. She also serves as faculty director of the Center for Women and Work. Professor Rogers specializes in using quantitative methods and large data sets to conduct research on women's health, labor market status, and well being. She has worked regularly as a consultant for the World Bank, the United Nations, and the Asian Development Bank, and she was president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. She currently serves as an associate editor with the journals World Development and Feminist Economics. Professor Rogers earned her PhD in economics from Harvard University. And she's a migrant in the States, as she's actually originally from a neighboring country, namely the Netherlands. Professor Rogers, 
We are really delighted to have you here. We look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Stichel, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction and good afternoon. Uh, good evening, good morning to the participants, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome, and it's a pleasure to be talking to you today. Uh, I will be using a um, PowerPoint presentation, which I am opening up now. And um, the topic today will be how to build a feminist economy during this COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, what I will be talking with you about, as uh, Professor von Stigl suggested, is uh, this is very much a gender dimension. So um, ultimately, I'd like you to walk away with two points. Uh, if you don't remember anything else today, I'd like you to remember two things. When you hear uh, about this pandemic and you listen to the news and you read studies, um, there's gender dimensions along almost every uh, parameter of this outbreak. Uh, and we'll be talking about that today, both for men as well as women. Uh, gender doesn't always mean it's just women. Um, and the other lesson I'd like to leave with you is the importance of care and the importance of having a care-led economy. So um, those will be the two things I'll talk about today. Uh, what we'll see is that um, men around the globe uh, really are experiencing a disadvantage in terms of getting sick from COVID-19 and dying from COVID-19. Uh, but after that, um, as Professor von Stichel suggested, uh, the disadvantages uh, turn to women especially uh, when it comes to women in frontline jobs. Um, and that's when we look at, we see care, paid care workers are the ones who are in the front lines. Uh, predominantly uh, nurses are women, nurses assistants, uh, home health aides, um, as well as workers in low wage jobs that have been deemed essential. They're all predominantly female jobs. And not only are they predominantly women's jobs, uh, often those women are minority groups or they're low wage workers, or depending on the country, a lower caste or lower class. Um, across countries, and we'll be seeing the evidence, we've also seen that uh, women have experienced larger job losses than men because they are disproportionately uh, working in industries and in occupations that have been hardest hit by the business closures. And finally, we will look at inside the home, again, looking at care, who is providing that care and what has happened during the pandemic. Um, so the, the key word to think about today is not only gender, but also care. Um, and we'll be looking at paid care workers as well as unpaid care going on in the home. And why do we care so much about care? Um, usually, uh, often in the past, care has been undervalued and invisible, and it still is, although this pandemic is really pointing a spotlight at the importance of care. Our lives depend on paid care workers, and our lives depend on the unpaid care that's happening in the home. Um, and this is actually an issue that um, scholars in my subdiscipline in economics, feminist economics, have been looking at for decades, um, is the importance of care and women's disproportionate role in performing this care. Um, so um, I believe our profession really has some valuable lessons that we'll talk about today uh, in shaping policies um, to recover from this pandemic um, as we navigate the economic fallout um, and the recovery period. Um, so in terms of the toll on health, uh, let's look first at how COVID has disrupted our lives. Um, the data do show uh, many countries, the majority of countries, um, men have experienced a disproportionate number of cases of COVID-19 infections, as well as higher mortality. Um, I looked at some data for 112 countries that have reported sex disaggregated cases, as well as mortality. And if you just do a straight 
Ford average, um, population weighted average, uh, 51% of all COVID-19 cases are among men, uh, compared to about 49% for women. And we see even a higher uh, disadvantage for men in terms of mortality, 58% versus 42%. And there's a number of explanations for men's higher risk. Uh, include more risk behaviors like smoking and drinking, um, other comorbidities like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. Um, they're less likely to use safe health practices like washing hands or seeking preventive care. And there's even some evidence showing that men's immune systems may not be as effective as those of women in fighting viruses. Um, this is hard to see in terms of the individual countries, uh, but these are all the countries in the uh, data globally that report sex disaggregated statistics on COVID-19 cases. And um, all you really need to uh, see is the light blue is the percent men. And you can see that in the majority of countries, um, men have a greater than 50% rate of um, having a COVID-19 infection. And in a small number or smaller number of countries, uh, women have more infections, but it's mostly men. Um, there's also been major disruptions in markets and livelihoods. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit now on paid jobs. And in the front line, care jobs, we've seen an overrepresentation of women and minorities who are still working during the pandemic and facing a greater risk of contracting the disease. Uh, initially, it was uh, the healthcare workers who we heard so much about uh, in the news across countries and other paid care workers were incredibly vulnerable, especially when there were such shortages around the globe in personal protective equipment. And some of my research uh, looked at those shortages, and a large part of it is due to our dependence on China uh, in the global supply chain for personal protective equipment. They are the world's largest exporter of personal protective equipment and their exports virtually came to a halt at the end of 20. 19, and that caused shortages around the globe in PPE in most countries, including uh, the US and in many countries in Europe, which contributed to the vulnerability of um, healthcare workers. 70% of workers in healthcare and social services globally are women. Um, and those are not the only vulnerable workers. We also see those who work in grocery stores, uh, bus drivers, train conductors, uh, people in warehouses, logistics, uh, cleaning services, home aides, people who provide childcare, and even postal service. And many of these jobs um, have a larger proportion of women than men. Um, I do have a few um, charts to show you. This one is data from the US that shows on average 52% uh, of essential workers are um, female. This is data from the New York Times, and that's coming largely from social workers and healthcare workers, as well as uh, retail clerks. Um, we've also seen uh, gendered effects in terms of job losses, uh, and these are industries and occupations that have been impacted by business closures and lockdowns. Uh, on average, in many countries, not all, uh, we've seen greater job losses for women and higher unemployment rates uh, for women. And more recently, we're also seeing a drop in labor force participation for men and women, uh, but larger for uh, women. And this is because um, women are staying home, being forced to, or uh, have other, a few other opportunities and needing to care for children who are home, needing um, uh, supervision, needing care, and needing schooling uh, from home. So seeing more uh, dropouts of the labor force completely for that reason. Uh, here's a little bit more data first from the US and then uh, some global data. Um, the gray bars show job losses for men 
and the red bars show job losses for women. Um, and this is during the initial months of the pandemic. And again, we see some of the largest hit sectors are in services, especially leisure and hospitality and education and health, as well as retail trade. And now with many countries uh, seeing a surge again in the number of cases and more restrictions, we might again witness some of this in the coming months. Um, in the US, we've also seen higher unemployment rates, not just for women, but for minority women, especially black women and Hispanic women. And this is a data from um, a paper with my co-authors. It's coming out in the journal Feminist Economics, showing uh, data from the International Labor Organization, uh, job losses since uh, April. So April to April, 2019 to 2020. And we can see that in most countries uh, for which we do have gender disaggregated data uh, month by month, women's job losses outpaced those of men, including uh, Colombia, Canada, Ecuador, uh, Moldova, Spain, um, the US, Switzerland, Korea, most countries, Japan. There's just a couple of exceptions. Um, we also need to look at what's happening in the home. Um, where we've seen an increase in domestic violence. Uh, the UN is starting to come out with data on that. And um, in the journal where I'm editor, Feminist Economics, we have a new paper um, that uses data from uh, mobile tracking uh, device data collection, as well as police reports and crime data, and shows that domestic violence rose by about 6% uh, in just a one month period um, in this past spring. Um, we're also seeing across countries an increase in unpaid care work being done at home. And here um, I'll show you a little bit of uh, data that I collected with some colleagues at the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers, as well as the Rutgers Business School. And our motivation was to try to collect some real time data using a, our own survey to. Um, complement or supplement what we were hearing a lot about in the news about women doing most of the unpaid care work at home. So our survey, uh, we got close to a thousand respondents. We did focus on opposite gender partnerships uh, using US data. And we did see that unpaid care work rose for both men and women, uh, especially for providing childcare and doing household chores, but it rose more for women. Um, we were a little surprised to see that men were actually doing more care work for elderly and disabled family members than women. Um, altogether, our uh, statistical work showed that when men did more work at home, it contributed to greater work satisfaction and greater productivity for women in their jobs. That the opposite direction did not hold. We didn't see any such relationship for men's productivity and work satisfaction. So men stepping up at home and doing more um, helps women in terms of their job performance. So here's just a little bit of data from that study that um, we're completing right now. So this is all new data um, showing in the dark blue during COVID. Light blue is before COVID and we see um, men's and women's contributions to child care and to household uh, daily work, household chores. And it increased for both men and women, but more for women than men. Um, but this is for elder care as well as disabled family member care. And here we actually see men doing uh, more than women and men also stepping up more during the pandemic compared to before. And finally, um, the statistical work we did showed a statistically significant um, increase in women's paid job productivity and satisfaction um, associated with an increase in men's contribution to work at home. So I want to conclude with a couple of slides um, related to the title of the talk, what do we do with all of this? 
where do we go from here? How do we build a feminist economy? So this um, shock, uh, this pandemic I think is really changing social norms around um, unpaid care work at home, as our research is showing, and the clear need for a more equitable distribution of work in the home. Um, corporations can do more to support that objective with um, private policies. Um, I'm optimistic now that telecommuting will be more normal in the long term um, and companies will be more open to family friendly policies besides telecommuting like job sharing and flex time. Um, employers, now many of them working from home with their children in the same room or the next room, I think are seeing firsthand and need to continue to take the mask off of this overlap that's happening between paid work and family work, work at home, and they need to take the stigma out of people um, taking advantage of family-friendly policies. Uh, there's a lot that governments around the world can do to support working families, support low-income workers, and to reduce discrimination. Um, in the U.S. especially, uh, we are so behind uh, most other countries around the globe in terms of paid family leave, paid sick leave. It's desperately needed at the federal level, and even many U.S. states do not have paid family leave or paid sick leave. Um, but around the globe, what we also need to focus on is universally accessible, free child care as well as long-term elder care. And that, I think, is the basis for a care-led recovery from COVID-19 and probably one of the most important policies we can think about. But there's others. Um, higher um, rates of unemployment insurance that are extended for longer periods of time. Uh, subsidies for small businesses. A greater support for essential workers who are still facing risks who need help with childcare and other uh, emergency needs. Um, many people now are in risk of losing their homes because they can't meet their rent payments or their mortgage uh, payments. So better protections uh, in terms of fair housing laws and other protections to help people keep their homes or purchase homes. And we also need to do more to enforce anti-discrimination legislation and other worker protections that are on the books, but not always enforced very well. Um, my other research on personal protective equipment show this, shows that there's much that countries around the globe can do, including the US. Uh, first is that hospitals need to um, provide bigger uh, inventories of personal protective equipment our research showed that in the U.S. at least, it's often the profit motive that governs how big inventories are of PPE and they're not big enough. Uh, governments can take a bigger role in maintaining and distributing stockpiles of personal protective equipment and regulations around PPE can be enforced better, uh, including ensuring the right size for each employee, male and female. Uh, women often need smaller um, size gowns and smaller headgear, and that's not always in stock. And finally, countries can consider strategic industrial policy so that they're not as dependent on the global supply chain for personal protective equipment. Um, other policies include better enforcement of uh, domestic violence laws, as well as funding for prevention and other support initiatives to mitigate domestic violence. Um, another policy priority I've written about is uh, making reproductive health care uh, more accessible and to prioritize it rather than stigmatize it or marginalize it as non-essential, which makes it very difficult for women to access their contraceptive needs and safe abortion needs during the pandemic. Um, another policy recommendation is better access to employment and training programs, especially in healthcare. Many countries have nursing shortages, 
And now in this time of need for more jobs is a perfect opportunity to provide better training and employment opportunities in healthcare. Um, the bottom line is that we need to avoid austerity induced budget cuts. This is not the time to do austerity kind of policies. We need stimulative spending that focuses on care. So as my closing word, I want to emphasize how important it is to design economic policy and to implement economic policy within this broader feminist framework where we think about human well-being and social justice instead of just focusing on output-based metrics like economic growth. And that is also consistent with the message that we just saw in the video about sustainable economies. We cannot have sustainable economies without a focus on care. And with that, I will um, finish and um, close my slide. Okay, thank you, Professor Rogers. Um, I don't have time to really summarize what you have been saying, but thank you for your very clear and interesting presentation and for showing us why we need to care for care, um, um, not just for women, but basically for the, the human development of all of us all together. So thank you. Um, I can imagine, participants, that you have some questions and remarks. So if so, please make use of the chat to use this opportunity. We look forward to your comments and we will try to tackle some of them. Um, uh, in the Q&A session that will come after our second speaker. Um, we now turn to the second speaker, which is Mrs. Ilse de Voogt, a historian who started her work, um, her working career as a journalist and as a staff member of the Flemish University Council. Currently, she's a policy officer for FEMA. And FEMA is one of the most famous social cultural organizations here in Flanders and Brussels, focusing on working with and for women for about 100 years now. Some figures, Emma consists of 730 local women's networks with 50, with 50 full-time equivalent staff members, supporting the more than 44,000 voluntary members. And concerning the topic of the webinar today, FEMA is recently very well known for its controversial but challenging plea for a 30-hour working week instead of a 40-hour one, speaking from a feminist perspective. And if I'm not mistaken, experiments are actually taking place to check its viability. Mrs. De Vogt, thank you very much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can everybody uh, hear me? I uh, turned up my uh, audience, it's okay. So I have prepared a presentation as well, and I will uh, give you the next 15 minutes an insight in our action research about the new full time, and we call uh, the 30 hour working week our new full time. And I will tell you something about uh, the why and the how of this research, and I will show the results of this uh, research. So, why did we set up an action uh, research? Um, because ensuring that everyone can combine work, care and leisure in a balanced and high quality manner is a major social challenge. Many people are struggling with this concept. At the social level, its impact rises between women and men. FEMA wrote a report addressing the challenge in which the organization proposes different strategies to make a balanced and equal combination of paid and unpaid labor possible for everyone. The new full-time is one of these strategies. A shorter working week is the subject of much debate at home and abroad as a tool for redistributing labor, increasing productivity, improving quality of life and combating climate change. FEMA approaches the shorter working week explicitly as an instrument to create more equality, social economic between men and women, between paid and unpaid work. How did we set up this um, re research? Um, our research is based on three pillars, as you can see, the legal technical pillar, the investment pillar and the research pillar. Uh, something about the investment pillar. Um, 
our uh, investment, um, we saw that our staff costs increased by 2.7% in 2019. Um, we created jobs, we outsourced some tasks, we also um, did a reassessment. Um, we had to pay higher wages to uh, our staff members who work in little part-time jobs. They didn't work less hours, so we had to give them a similar benefit in wages in proportion to their break in employment. In our 30-hour working week, we saw a decline of overtime hours and so-called off days. We noticed that no one took a care leave and we saw that staff members who work in a large part-time job, 28 hours a week, opted for the new full-time of three hours a week. And that's important because it substantiates our claim that working less in a new full-time means that a lot of people, mostly women, would, more, would work more hours because it's better for their social rights and their career. About the research, we wanted to investigate the effects of the shorter working week on the lives of our staff, on their general time use, on their combination of work time and leisure, on their paid work, on their organization and experience of household tasks and childcare, on their personal leisure, their social relationships and their mental and physical well-being. And we also wanted to investigate the effects of the shorter working week on children. In the discussion about work-life balance, you hardly hear the voice of the children. That's a shame because work-life balance, it's not just an issue of adults. For our data collection and analysis, we entered into a partnership with the research group TORF of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel and the research center in and samenleving child and society. And the data collection of the TORF consisted of a combination of questionnaires, time registration in the form of diaries, focus group interviews and depth interviews. All FEMA staff members were invited to participate in the action research. The response rate of the staff members over the different measuring moments was between 84 and 92 percent. Partners of staff members were also asked to, to, to participate in the survey and uh, this data is still being processed. And then Samenleving set up a small scale qualitative research project this research focused on children of FEMA staff between the ages of 8 and 18 years, and six children were interviewed. Now, uh, the results. Um, we summarized the results in six teams, uh, wishes and satisfaction, more peace and balance, more time for housekeeping, less household stress, more time for leisure, social and personal care, parents and children have more quality time and positive evaluation of feasibility and quality of work. So, vicious reality and satisfaction. Uh, prior to the transition to the 30-hour working week, respondents were asked how they like to spend those uh, freed up hours. They wished mainly to spend extra time on leisure for themselves. The daily reality made this partially successful, but nevertheless, the majority is satisfied with the way they spend their time. When uh, interpreting the time expenditure data, it's important to note that we start from the parameter duration per respondent. This is the time spent on a particular activity in a week, calculated for all participants in survey. The duration per respondent refers to everyone, including those who didn't carry out the activity in question. So that's important to know. Um, subject uh, to more peace and balance. Uh, we saw that the respondents were quite satisfied with the way filled in the hours released. This satisfaction is related to the fact that they seem to find more balance and rest in the new full time. 
and asked about their satisfaction with the way they combine work, care and leisure, we see a significant improvement for the full-time staff members. They experience also less work-life conflict and there is a decrease in workload. Workload is the sum of paid work, domestic work and care work. This decrease indicates that time released from paid work was not fully taken up by domestic work and care work. And finally, there is a decrease in general time uh, pressure. It indicates that the respondents didn't fill the time available with new activities. This would increase the time pressure again. Although spending more time on domestic work was not high on many respondents' wish lists, a significant proportion of their time off went to it. This sometimes creates tensions in the relationship, but more time for domestic work also has positive effects. We see that there is a slight increase in satisfaction with the organization of the household. We see also that respondents experience less household stress there is less multitasking and they perceive some tasks as less annoying. The 30 hour working week ensures that respondents have more time for leisure, social contacts and self care. They do not make time for new hobbies, but spend their time mainly to hobbies and activities they already did. And again, you know, that more time available means that there is less stress and pressure. The quality of and satisfaction with leisure time and social participation increases dur during the new full time. In the category social participation, it's noticeable that the group of respondents with children living at home signs significantly more time to social contacts talking, discussing, visiting and being visited. In the social activities, the focus is more on children and family and less on friends. And we notice an increase in personal care, particularly among respondents with children living at home. There is more room for the hairdresser, the doctor, the dentist and the physiotherapist, for eating and drinking and for sleeping. The impact of the 30-hour working week on the children can be seen from two angles. On the one hand, through the time expenditure survey conducted among the parents, and on the other hand, through the qualitative survey among the children themselves. Both parents and their children indicate that the 30-hour week has a value both on their relationship and the time they spend together. The time expenditure survey shows that respondents with children living in the 30 hour week spend a little more time with children. Moreover, we see, a, we see a slight shift from being together to doing things together, like playing and visiting family. As mentioned earlier, the better work-life balance and the increase in quiet in the household and in leisure time are also reflected in the bond with the children. Asked about the quality of the time and the bond with their children, parents indicate that it has significantly improved. The 30-hour week ensures that respondents are more satisfied with the organization of childcare and its distri distribution with the partner, but we also notice a polarization here. It creates some, sometimes tension with the partner. Now, children, the qualitative research uh, confirms that uh, children appreciate the attention of parents and presents. They feel stress and the loss of it. 30 hour a week had the biggest impact on children who feel bottlenecks in family time, like uh, less time than desire to do things, too busy uh, mornings or evenings. The research shows that the 30 hour working week has a valuable effect on the families in three ways. There is more time, there is more quality time, and children get more autonomy. The extra time for children and for the family was mainly invested in the transitional moments of the day, the moments when family members split up in the morning and come together again in the evening, and for those moments, more time was taken. 
Children say that the quality of the time spent with their parents improved. Children often have the desire to have more time together and really things together, like playing games. In the 30-hour week, there was room for this in some families. Having time is a basic condition for autonomy. Thanks to the parents' breathing space, the children also have more control over family time. There was more opportunity to do the homework at home and not at school. Children sometimes also got more control over the time outside the, high, outside the house, for example, about how long they stay at daycare. And we have also positive evaluation of the feasibility and quality of work. Uh, we measured the impact on the quality of work and the work itself, uh, both at the level of the respondents uh, via the VUB time expenditure study and at the level of the organization um, with our own FEMA analysis data. The transition to the 30-hour working week did not increase the work pressure among the respondents. They do indicate that the 30-hour working week has made them more focused and efficient with less multitasking. With a study that lasted one year, we can only make very cautious statements about the relationship between working shorter and absenteeism. And what we see is a decrease in off days with 22%. In the third working week, more respondents are also convinced that the regime allows them to continue working until their retirement age, uh, it's uh, 67 years in Belgium, uh, compared to the 36-hour working week or the old full-time. And both at individual level and at the level of the organization, we can state that we achieved our goals in the 30-hour working week. This uh, research shows that po the potential of the new full time and how valuable it was found. Of course, it has its limitations. There are many interesting questions left, as you can see. And we hope that our research inspires many others, companies, governments, and researchers to explore those interesting uh, questions uh, left. If uh, you want more uh, info, about our, uh, this research, you will find uh, the full report in this uh, at um, www.gericht.evenwicht.be. It will be pub published soon there. Uh, and there are also some interesting Facebook groups, uh, the Corp Workweek in Belgium, the Shorting Working Week Movement in the UK, uh, the Sex Timmers Arbeidsdag in Sweden. And if you have uh, questions for, for, uh, for me or uh, you can uh, contact me uh, at ilsedevoogd at fema.be or you can contact my colleague Jeroen Lievens at fema.be. Thank you for the time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. De Voogd, for this uh, interesting and challenging uh, proposal. I see that some comments are coming up, so it is triggering some um, reflections and thoughts. thoughts. Um, First, I go back to the, um, the presentation of Professor Rogers. Um, there's a very practical question, and that is to what extent some of the data you have already mentioned uh, are being published or have been published and whether it would be possible to share them. Maybe we can have um, an email conversation after that and it could be an idea that we put some data on the website or some links if it is already published or not. But, so there's an interest in your topic in any way. But on the content, there was a question from someone asking whether you also considered in your research non-material work, emotional care, psychological care. So is, for instance, psychological care considered as part of the economy as well? How, how, where do we see that? How, or, yeah. Okay. Um, I would call that as a label mental health and care for mental health. And that's very, very much considered health care and crucially important, especially during this time of uh, the pandemic, you know, and other marginalized groups that I'm doing um, research on that I didn't mention during the presentation, but the LGBTQ plus community, um, you know, uh, is um, disproportionately impacted by rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, suicidality. So to maintain um, mental health care as an essential 
Now, healthcare service is crucially important for this particular population, you know, as for other populations. So, yes, my message applies very much for mental health care, you know, as well as the psychological unpaid care that's happening within the home. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe before I go to the presentation of, uh, of uh, Mrs. DeVogt, do you have any comments or a question or something for, for um, Mrs. DeVogt? Um, I do. I was reading the chat and um, one of the uh, people in the chat asked about the uh, gender gap and whether there might be, um, you know, any kind of retaliation or discrimination if more women are likely to take advantage of, you know, a 30-hour work week than men, and if that could have perhaps some unintended effects um, from employers. I know uh, in uh, many countries' histories, we've had working hour restrictions that were more severe for women than men, um, even informally, without regulations. Are women more likely to take advantage of it than men? And could that um, have negative effects in terms of their wages and employment? Okay, that's for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when we propose a 30 hour working week, we uh, propose it as a new uh, social uh, norm. Not only a 30 hour working week for women, but for men and women, like we now have the 38 working week. As the, um, the the norm for um, in Belgium, so um, it's 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 one strategy. Eh? In our report, we notice that there are that there, that we need more strategies to become to uh, a more equal uh, division of paid and unpaid work between men and women. Um, uh, we have. Uh, to create uh, parental leave systems that are gender sensitive. Uh, so um, I think a 30 hour working week is uh, um, not a silver or silver bullet, but it creates the possibility to an equal share of um, uh, paid and unpaid work between men and women. Um, and yeah, so I didn't, I, we did, we, yeah, that's our, our um, that's our opinion about it. Okay. Um, on that note, uh, Mrs. De Vogt, there is the, also the question: Are there first steps? Since you consider it as a as a new social norm, are there what are the first steps to be taken to implement it uh, nationwide, for instance? Nationwide, yeah. um, I think. Um, yeah, you can do legislation is also needed. Um, we have a, a, a legal advice formulated by progress lawyers uh, and it's, uh, it's going to the level of the European Social um, Charter and uh, the, the, um, the European Social Charter says that we have to uh, go to, uh, to shorter working weeks if the productivity allows it. Um, and uh, there should be legislation um, and now in Belgium uh, you can already install a 30-hour working week and uh, as an employer because you can get some um, um, uh, you, you have to pay uh, less taxes on um, uh, when you introdu introduce it um, uh, um, so, uh, sociale zekerheidsbijdrage. How do you uh, say it in English? Um, yeah, so you can social security taxes when you intro introduce it. So you have we you have the possibility to do it, um, and um, we have. You can, we can do it. Um, we see it abroad in Sweden, in New Zealand, in Finland. There are many, many examples of, of, um, of uh, organizations who are doing it, who are introducing the 30 hour working week. And it's a question of inspiring organizations of people, of governments to um, set experiments up and to 
to show people that uh, there is a room for another um, economy, a feminist economy, because we see the 30 hour working week also as a part of a feminist economy. Okay. Um, I'm going to take two comments together because they kind of relate to one another. Um, someone said it's not just about the number of working hours, but also about how you spend them. And so now we've seen that uh, with teleworking is, is, um, can help. Eh? Um, it's, it's more and more socially accepted and both the climate and the work-life balance um, are benefiting from it. Um, how did you take that into, into conservation? As a, as a side effect, on the other hand, someone said, well, uh, don't you fear that these kind of uh, things could also um, have an impact on collective dy dynam dynamics and so individualizing work? So, for example, people being more forced to finish their work on time, etc. Um, yeah, I don't know whether um, you can comment on that. Yeah. yeah, okay, about telework, it's important. Mm -hmm. eh? We also do on telework with FEMA, but telework is something for the um, for the higher educated people, um, a lot of people can't telework. When you are working in care, when you are working in, in other sectors, um, you, you, you can't stay at home to do your work. And that's, um, that's not possible. Um, so that's one thing, it, it could help, but not for everyone. And then uh, we also believe that we have a need, we need to take collective, um, uh, um, measures to uh, to to ensure that everyone can uh, um, can uh, have some individual freedom. Eh? We introduced 30-hour working week, and 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 people could choose how they uh, would implement it in four days or in five days. So collective doesn't mean that everyone has to do it uh, on the same way and uh, collective measures are very important for, for those who have it very difficult in uh, our society. So um, I hope that's an answer to the second question. Okay, um, yeah. maybe to um, wrap up more or less, um, I have a question here, Professor Henrik of the Bake of the uh, Chair of the uh, Economy of Hope. Uh, both in the Church of Francesco and our economy, a better gender balance is a crucial necessity to survive. Is the fact that Pope Francis is insisting on this topic a sign of hope for this necessary paradigm shift? Can we explain why exactly? Um, uh, Mrs. Roger, I saw you nodding. Oh, I think it's definitely a sign of hope. Um, we've been talking about changing social norms, changing institutions, changing traditions and attitudes, changing what happens uh, among employers and what happens within the home. I think the fact that um, one of the world's most respected leaders and the leader of uh, the church is insisting on um, talking about and thinking about and acting towards this change is hugely hopeful and necessary especially given the power of the Catholic Church globally, um, I think this is a strong sign of optimism. Hey, thank you. Mrs. DeVoot, would you would like to comment on this? Elsa? Okay. Um, oh, and then, excuse me. I was no, no. Uh, I fell away. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So can you repeat the question because I was uh, the is whether it's um, with, uh, whether it's a sign of hope that Pope Francis is now also focusing on this uh, need for a better gender balance. Um, um, yes, and maybe related to that. Um, so there are thousands and thousands of people who will gather next week for this economy of Francesca, young people. Um, maybe it would be nice if we end by um, a reflection of both of you on. Um, what would be the message you give? You want to give them? They're entrepreneurs, scientists, etc. But at least uh, young people below 35 who want to make change happen um, in the economy and thus in our daily lives. What What would be your message for them? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm working for a social cultural organization, 
and mm -hmm. uh, my lesson my lesson is you have to engage you have to be informed you have you can take action as an individual you have to join um uh yeah um movements and 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 yeah that's very important you have to undertake action uh, sign petitions um uh, practice what you preach uh, so that's my message as a, a as a policy officer of a social cultural movement. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Professor Rutgers. And I think my message would be that um, young people do have the power to make change. Uh, witness what just happened, uh, what was just announced, you know, in where I live in the US over the weekend and the new presidency. I think the power of young people has a lot to do with that. They got out, they uh, advocated, they voted, they took action. So um, I think young people need to know they do have power for change and they have made change and they will continue to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so as we now come to conclude this session, uh, I wish to thank the organizing committee of UXIA, the Trans Economy of Hope Chair and the Economy of Communion as well as our distinguished speakers, Mr. Rogers and Mr. De Wolf, for your invaluable contributions. So now they would follow an applause, but I'm giving it to you virtually. But thank you very much. Um, and thank all of you who participated in this webinar. I hope it was enriching and inspiring. And if you want to know how these and many conversations continue, you can take a look at the YouTube channel of UXIA and or of the economy of Francesco, which will take place next week. And for the rest, I would say, uh, Take care, stay safe.